Dua and Trevor, Saban and Swinney, Hunter Renfro versus the AARP, and NFL Wild Card Weekend. My four no, around the no, floor. No, no, no. Let's go around the horn. That was joint and joint. One common script to Wild Card Weekend. What were they thinking? Every losing team's play calling <laughs> and the referees with their own calling of plays. But for the Chicago Bears, for Cody Parkey, there was only one thing they were thinking. Please don't do it. Please don't do it. Not again. The history here is inconceivable. Look at this post from Cody Parkey years ago describing how he used to practice by hitting a light post. The five doinks from earlier this season. The late night practice escorts to Soldier Field with news chopper overhead. And now the two here to end the season. Trayvon Hester got a tip of a tip at the line. There's the how Nick Foles did it again and how the champs move on is the team nobody wants to play. But first, how the Bears process this. Jay, you're in Chicago. How should the city swallow this today? Well, they should be most disappointed because the defense let them down. You know Bears fans love their defense, monsters of the midway, and all that. And this game was in the defense's hand to secure the victory, and they couldn't come through, allowing the Eagles to drive 60 yards for the go-ahead score, and the defense let them down. Throughout the game, honestly, because they didn't make the adjustments, Jason Peters did a tremendous job in his matchup with Khalil Mack. So how about overloading that side, sending some extra rushers from that side, taking advantage of your best pass rusher who was handled in single coverage. So I'm going to put it on the defense, which is supposed to be the heart and soul of this team. You asked your defense to win the game. You should be comfortable being in position for them to win it for you with a couple plays, they could not. So your headline through. isn't Cody Parkey, double doinks. Your headline is the defense as fails. As much as I love the, the double doink, limited. and there are some great puns based off it, him hitting it off the uprights, clanks for the memories, they said in the Philadelphia Daily News. Great headline material, but the real story of the day, game should be this Is that day. how you see it, Kevin Blackstone? Well, Cody Parker outscored Parkey. the rest of the offense. He was three for four uh, with his field goals yesterday. It was the offense that let down Chicago and, and put everything, all the pressure, on the defense. Now, the defense did a pretty good job all day long up until that drive where they let Foles be the Foles from a year ago. Until that time, they had controlled him. They had controlled this game. But the offense had to come through and help the rest, the other phases of the, uh, of, of the game. They had to help defense. They had to help special teams. They didn't do it. Didn't put so up now your headline is Bears offense fails them, and that's why their season is over. I saw you're shaking yep. your head. No, go ahead. Nah, Kevin, that, that's unfair. First of all, the offense gave them the lead, and then Trubisky drove them into position for the game-winning kick. So the field goal kicker there, that is a very makeable kick. That's one you have to make, and we know that he hasn't made it. That being said, the strength of this team is the defense, and what they're going to remember from this season is 12 plays, 60 yards. That's what Nick Foles did. He converted a third and nine, and then a fourth and two for the go-ahead score. The strength of the team was defense, and at the moment of truth, at home, they let them Okay, so, so all this outsized reaction from Chicago about the kicker, Cody Parkey. And we went through this this year when he had joined four in a game. The escorts to Soldier Field for that late night practice where there was a chopper overhead. And we couldn't show you the video because the Bears didn't want that video out. You think this is about the defense. How about you, Georgie Sedano? Tony, I don't know what Frank and Jay have been doing over the holidays, maybe hanging out in the Adande Lounge too much, having a few extra cocktails during the holidays, but maybe this not. is all about the offense. KB's okay. right. Thank Look, you. Parkey scored nine points. The rest of that offense scored six points. The defense, they only allowed 16 points. They allowed 17.7 during the regular season. One scoring drive out of 11. Matt Nagy's supposed to be this offensive genius. Where was the genius yesterday? Mm -hmm. You thought the time uh, management in the end of this game was also problematic? Yeah, the time management, particularly on the defensive side. He wasted 30 or 40 seconds basically on the clock, not calling timeouts earlier than he should have. I don't understand what he was doing there. It was very obvious he was a rookie coach in a playoff I've situation. Heard this, I've heard this complaint as well, but my, my, my point to that would be, 
They had enough time to get down the field and have a very makeable field goal. Frank, I saw that you're nodding in agreement. Go ahead. Yeah, th th that's the exact point. You know, Trubisky in his first ever playoff game scored in the fourth quarter, gave them the lead. Then after they fell behind, he drove them into position for a makeable kick. You guys are making it seem like they were trying to make a 60-yard field goal. That was a makeable kick. I'm not blaming the offense. The offense in the fourth quarter did their job. Defense, special teams, the And he made it once. He made it before he was iced. I mean, here's my point on that kick, right? Matt Nagy knows his kicker has missed double-digit kicks this season. And he knows where he likes to be on the field, where he doesn't like to be on the field. So he knew all that going into it. Yeah. But I don't think it was a lack of time that got them there. Bears had plenty of time. They used their time out on that last drive as well. So, so I just want to get this clear. Nobody is blaming Cody Parkey for this loss. Nobody. That's good. Okay. Well, wait a second. I, I don't all know. On all him. right. George, go ahead, please. Okay, I, I would blame him a little bit. You know, look, there are some of the comparisons being made are like Bartman-esque. I wouldn't go Bartman-esque. What I would do is blame the guy after Bartman. If we remember in Chicago, Alex Gonzalez, the shortstop, booted a ball after that that would have ended that inning. That's, to me, the comparison with Cody Parker. He does have some blame, even though it looked like it might have been tipped a little bit. But at the end of the day, this isn't like Bartman-esque or even Bill Buckner-esque. Well, Bartman can slide on down like the old Johnny Carson show. He can move a seat over now because he, we do have a new person replacing him atop the Chicago sports fan most wanted list. But think about it. Bartman didn't lose that series. They had a whole game seven to win it back, and they had other opportunities to win this game. Isola. You know, uh, Blair Walsh, four years ago with Minnesota in a game, playoff game, home game against Seattle, made his first three kicks, missed a chip shot late. By the following November, he struggled. He ended up getting released. You wonder how much this performance, the surely, ending of this surely. game, will I mean, we, we've seen this uh, in this sport. We've seen this with this position. We've seen this all over the place. Although, Adan, I'm, I'm going to oppose you here, the idea that there needs to be somebody to blame, needs to be somebody on line to blame here. I mean, an inexperienced team playing at home, but an inexperienced team, a young team, lost the playoff game to the defending champs. That couldn't be enough. That could be the headline here. The Eagles, by the way, have to be a team Nobody wants to play right now. I got mutes for this entire panel, except Frank Isola. Did you have Philly on Friday, Frank Isola? No. no you get a double mute, Dan. You had Chicago. Uh, Bill Plasky, uh, when he shows up, it's going to be a wave of mutilation. But the Nick Foles run continues. The Doug Peterson luck on fourth down continues. And the Eagles defense, and secondary specifically, coming together like nobody saw possible. This has got to be more than magic, right? This is a schematic, experiential reason why this is happening, Frank. T Tony, Nick Foles has won four playoff games, and this one was on the road, and he was behind in the fourth quarter. You think about what he did in the Super Bowl last year against New England and what he did yesterday, and they're going to have a big choice on their hands this offseason. They can resign Carson Wentz, save a little money on the salary cap, how are you not going to bring Nick Foles back? What more does he need to do? He's 4-0 and oh in the playoffs. And who knows, maybe 5-6-7-0. Oh so this is 5-6-7-0. Oh. Now you're getting ahead of yourself a little bit, which I'm fine with. You, can, you Please, go ahead. Why would you doubt Nick Foles at this point? But this conversation for you is about what they're going to do in the offseason. I think we can hit pause on that just for a moment, Blackstone. How is this happening with Nick Foles? Well, it's happening with Nick Foles because his team gave him an opportunity. I was just talking about offense. Let's talk about defense. This is an Eagles team that got blown away by New Orleans back in November. At that time, their defense was ranked 20th. At the end of the year, it was ranked 12th. And you saw the, you saw the difference yesterday. They had pressure all over Trubisky. They were able to keep their team in there. And when it was time for Nick Foles to come through, he came through. Now, the rest of the game, he was not very good. Threw a horrible pick into the end zone. You knew he wanted to take that one back. Yeah. But for that one time, he had that opportunity, and he came through and won for him. I really think the Eagles are past the hard part of the season. The hard part was getting back to the playoffs. Now that they're there, they have confidence. They have belief. They know their quarterback can get it done in crunch time. He's proven he's got a Super Bowl MVP trophy sitting at the crib. So this team is really playing pressure-free football, and they believe in themselves, and they can believe in their coach, unlike, say, the Bears with Matt Nagy. George Sedano. You talk to people around the league there, and particularly people in Philadelphia, Tony, and they tell you that Doug Peterson simplifies the offense when Nick Foles is in there. I don't understand why he doesn't do that with Carson Wentz, to be honest with you, but that's the biggest issue that they have. And let's face it, you mentioned they're Super Bowl champions, okay? He won a couple of games last year where they were ugly, right? He didn't necessarily win them. The team won them, particularly the defense. The defense doesn't get enough credit. Their mantra should be ugly but effective. Well, okay, I mean... 
that works, right? That absolutely works. Why, why would you yeah. doubt Nick Foles at this point? Even going in to a game against the New Orleans Saints, why would you doubt Nick Foles at this point? I, I don't understand that. And that conversation you want to have, Frank Isola, about the future of this team and whether it's with Foles or with Carson Wentz, anybody right now want to uh, go with Frank there and say Foles could be the future of this team. Sedano? Oh, I listen, come on, man. Let's be real here. Carson Wentz, unless Nick Foles wins another Super Bowl, there's no way in well, hell that's on the table. Of Carson that's, Wentz. that's on the table. Well, but here's the thing. Foles Second is more expensive hurt. than he is. And the upside, yeah, but you got to go with the kid, okay? The kid is the guy that was almost an MVP last year before he got hurt. It's not like he's had these surgeries or whatnot or injuries that are going to be right. catastrophic. He clearly is going to be able to come back from like them. I said, a conversation for another day. We'll move on. Rest of the wild card weekend in NFL in buy or sell. Now, college, let me hear it. College, tonight's national championship. Yeah. The only matchup you need, even the most ardent playoff expander knows that's the case this year. Clemson, Alabama, somebody's finishing the year 15-0 for the first time in football history. The key to victory, the most important thing in tonight's game. George, go ahead. Oh, the most important thing is the quarterback play. You look at Tua, he's got 41 touchdowns, four picks this year. Trevor Lawrence, no slouch, by the way. 27 yeah. touchdowns four and four picks, picks yeah. himself. And I think this is going to be one of these games where whoever has the ball last, Tony, is going to win this thing. Defense is dead, basically, in college oh, football. Okay. As much as we talk about how great Alabama's <laughs> players are on defense, and they are. They're great individual players. Clemson has great individual players. There'll be a bunch of first-round picks that are coming out of those defenses. But the way college football is now, it's all about the offense and how many so every preview I read that Alabama. said Alabama's front seven or front four is going to dominate this game decide how this game is won you say that throw that out the window there is no defense whoever has the ball last and you have Nonsense. Alabama Adon how about you George is right the key is the quarterbacks but Trevor Lawrence isn't the dual threat that Deshaun Watson was when when Clemson beat Alabama Deshaun Watson rushed 21 times only 43 yards but you had to think that dual threat kept Alabama's defense off balance now Trevor Lawrence has only rushed 54 times all season, so he's not the threat to run, and I think uh, Alabama can really tee off and key on him in the pocket, unlike when KB, the Washington matchup that will decide this game? Well, the matchup's going to decide it is going to be the running game of Clemson. They average 250 yeah. yards running. The they, they put the ball in Travis uh, Etienne's hands. Um, that's something that they did not have before, as J.A. just kind of mentioned. So I think whether or not they can run the ball effectively, also controlling the clock, which can give their defense um, some rest and get the ball into the end zone that way, I think that can change the tenor. So that's the game. path to victory for Clemson. Do you see that happening? I think so. You, I, yeah, I do see it. I think they got to do that. And not only that, you just look at Alabama's uh, last game, how they let OU get back into the game. I mean, they've had some struggles. Frank, I saw So, it. yeah, I see that. Clemson has to get to the quarterback. They sacked the quarterback 52 times this year. Now, Tua, we know, not really 100% with that ankle that he has. Not the same quarterback like most quarterbacks. When he gets pressured, obviously his uh, percent, you know, completion percentage goes down. To me, that will be the key. But I just think that Alabama, whenever they lose, it seems like a fluke. When they're trailing at halftime, it seems like a fluke. I just think they're too dominant. to find a way. So you got Alabama tonight. You want to give us a score, Frank? 34 to Blackstone. Uh, Clemson, 31-30. Adonde? 30-27. And, George, you've got, like, the, uh, the, the final being 72-70, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I got it 41-34. Right. Alabama. Take a break. Buy or sell on the other side. Stick around. Los Angeles Chargers. I'm waiting with bated breath for somebody to call them the team. Nobody wants to play in these playoffs. We're going to start That's with the Ravens and John Harbaugh's assertion sticking to Lamar Jackson was the right call. George, buy or sell? I'm buying it. He's going to have to coach him next year if he's still the coach. But he's the future. Joe Flacco's not. Ravens fans were booing Flacco anyway just a few weeks ago. Donde? Because they've made it clear that Flacco isn't under plans for next year, then I'm selling this because why not give it a shot? Nothing was going your way, and you don't have to worry about Lamar Jackson in a quarterback country in the offseason if Flacco's on his way out. Blackstone? I'm buying it. You needed a quarterback with mobility to stay out of that rush. And the other thing is, the fourth quarter, he is the best quarterback in the NFL this year in terms of quarterback. Isola. Rating. Almost showed it. 
Kevin, they were down 23-3 to in the fourth quarter. That's why you had to bring in Joe Flacco. We're making him sound like he's chopped liver. He did win a Super Bowl. He was the MVP. Give Anthony Lynn, the, the coach of the Chargers, a lot of credit. They played with seven defensive backs most well, of the game. Well, that's what it was, right? I, I want to ask this. Would you argue that Lamar's struggles yesterday were first career postseason start, teams catching up to him, or was it schematic, Frank? I think it's all of that. You know, he's a rookie quarterback, and I think that's why you go to the more experienced guy. If you can take Clayton Kershaw out of a World Series game, why can't Lamar Jackson come out of a playoff game and still be the quarterback of the future? Why not? Shaking your head no. It's ridiculous. KB hit it on the head. I mean, look at that pass rush. It was ferocious. There's no way Joe Flacco, who's a statue, is going to be able to avoid that. We'll move on. Buy or sell two. Cowboys in the discussion to be in the conversation to be a team. Nobody wants to play this postseason. How much of this was Dallas in the defense? How much of it was Seattle's insistence upon run, run, and never unleashing Russell Wilson, Jay? I'm going to give credit to the Dallas defense. Not for lack of trying. The Seahawks ran the ball 24 times, even though they weren't going anywhere. But look what Dallas did to the top rushing offense in the NFL. Just look what they did at home against the top three scoring offense with the Saints. KB? Yeah, I mean, you have to agree with that. I mean, that, that's a big difference with Seattle this year. You know, last year, Russell Wilson led them in rushing. This year, they had a full prong attack, and the, and the Cowboys absolutely shut it down. But sometimes you wonder about their head coach, who's a, who seems to be the brightest, smartest coach until he does something You're talking really about Pete like Carroll. So you're, you're questioning exactly. the play calling here to run, run. It seemed like first down, second down was run, run. And it was right into the middle of the line. I saw how about you? Let me give Seattle a little advice. When you're in the Super Bowl, you have Marshawn Lynch run the ball at the goal line. <laughs> in this case, against Dallas on the road, you have Russell Wilson throw the ball, especially on first down. I thought their game plan backfired big time. Good job by Dak Prescott. And George Russell Wilson is a top five QB in the league. He's arguably the best improvisational QB in the league. Brian Schottenheimer, gross mismanagement of the offense. If his last name wasn't Schottenheimer, he wouldn't get any more chances to run a mediocre offense Ooh, for another team. And gross mismanagement. Ooh. Is there any other kind? We'll move on. Fire cell three, Colts. Anybody want to play the Colts in the postseason? Anybody want to test their luck now? Same question. How much was Indy? How much was Houston, KB? Oh, this was all, I think, the Colts. I mean, this is what we've been looking at the last 10 or 11 weeks, so they've been reeling off W after W. They got a top 10 defense, a top 10 offense, and Andrew Luck is back. That's all. Yeah, first playoff game for Deshaun Watson. He really struggled, but they protect Andrew Luck. Here's a guy that has won a playoff game before. He looks terrific, and that defense of Indianapolis is for real. Watch out, Kansas City. I know. Frank Reich ran circles around the Belichick boys of O'Brien and Cornell. This is all about the Colts. Since their 1-5 start, they have the best record in the NFL. They've had the best point differential in the NFL. And their offensive line, which was much maligned, is awesome right now, running the ball and protecting luck. Watson and the Texans did not look prepared for NFL playoff football. Once they got their feet under them, they were okay in the second half, right? The Colts didn't score in the second half. So it's not like the Colts are this overwhelming offensive presence. They came in. You didn't think the Colts were in control the entire that game? Yeah, you didn't think they were in complete control the entirety of that game? It sounded like George, maybe KB, are, are on this Colts bandwagon and ready. I'm not, I'm not putting any words out there, but they, they play Kansas City next week. Sign Anybody want to say something right now? I'll take them. I, I think the Colts can win. There we go. All right. Absolutely. That's not enough to get Clack Stone into the showdown. But Frank Isola, George Sedano, 27s, and in the showdown next. Bang. This is a large Frank Isola in showdown. You just throw out the record book that you never kept to begin with. Good luck, gentlemen. Showdown one firing after a 22-point win to own the Tibbs. George, you are right with Minnesota's timing here. The timing is ridiculous, but it shouldn't be a surprise because really everything Minnesota's done outside of draft Kevin Garnett in those subsequent years has been pretty ridiculous. Though Tibbs did deserve to get fired, they probably should have fired him before the Jimmy Butler trade, though. Deserved? Before he got there, they had missed the playoffs 12 straight years. Now you have the owner saying, we're looking at the results. Really? All of a sudden, the results matter to you? Well, last year, you won 47 games, made the playoffs. And by the way, since the Jimmy Butler trade that we hear so much about, they're 15 and 12. So the results have actually been pretty good. Good stat work from Frank Isola. That's how you get a point. Showdown. We'll move on. Showdown two. Zion's 360 versus Dwayne Wade's no-look alley-oop. What was play of the weekend, Frank? 
I'll save the Miami one for the Miami guy, but come on. Every time Zion Williamson does something, let's remember, the guy is 285. For him to get up that easy and to perform something like that, it's ridiculous that it's only January and some people are getting bored with it. I'm not bored with it. Pretty impressive. Zion Williamson hit his head on the backboard one time. That's the most amazing thing he's ever done, to be honest with you. <laughs> Dwayne Wade has known Derrick Jones Jr. for like 30 seconds and was able to alley-oop it to him perfectly. D. Wade, veteran move. You need to have a firm relationship with somebody in order to throw an alley-oop? I don't know about that, do. George. Points, Come game, on. Frank Isola. There it is. That's the alley-oop to Isola. All right, with the final college football game tonight, we can turn our attention to college basketball. The top 25 came out, and guess who cracked it? St. John's and Chris Mullen right over the bridge. Right here is where Chris Mullen grew up. They beat Georgetown on Saturday in overtime. They haven't made the tournament since 2015, and right now they're 14-1. They're only lost a last-second shot against Seton Hall. So it looks like Chris Mullen has finally gotten things turned around, and who knows? Maybe his good buddy Patrick Ewing will get Georgetown in the tournament as well, like the olden days, St. John's and Georgetown, back in college. St. John's going over this week. Have going over tomorrow. That's a good one. I sold it with the win. That's going to do it, folks. Thanks for coming around. We're on a 23 and a half hour break. Where are my Boston College ladies at?